Thinking aloud. Conversations on the leading edge of knowledge and discovery with psychologist Jeffrey Mishlove. Hello and welcome. I'm Jeffrey Mishlove. This is part two of our three-part series on time, space, and consciousness with Dr. Fred Allen Wolf, also known occasionally as Dr. Quantum. Fred is the author of numerous books, and I've had the privilege of interviewing him on virtually all of them. Space, Time, and Beyond, Parallel Universes, The Body Quantum, The Spiritual Universe, The Dreaming Universe and more recently, matter into feeling, mind into matter, the yoga of time travel, and time loops and space twists, how God created the universe. Welcome again, Fred. Thank you, Jeffrey. Pleasure again. Let's begin to talk about the yoga of time travel. We were hinting at it, more than hinting at it. And uh, we were the getting end, there. We, we were getting, getting there at the, yeah, at the end of the previous interview. And I know that you've described yourself as a time traveler. Yes, and I've had time travel experiences, which we can also get into if you want to. But let's just talk about a little bit about the idea of the yoga of time travel, mm -hmm. because. What I started researching more into the mind-time connection, uh, I do what a lot of uh, composers of music do when they want to produce a new piece. They go to the ancient music places. Mm -hmm. Stravinsky, for example, went to the, uh, to the folk music of the tribal people in Russia mm -hmm. to create all of the Petrushka and the Rites of Spring and all of his great marvelous music yeah. uh, comes from these f these wonderful folk songs. So I went back and uh, and uh, went back in time to see what what did the ancients think about time mm -hmm. and so forth. And it's the the Indian philosophers are wonderful for this. They're mm -hmm. just fantastic. And the founder of yoga, Patanjali, was also a uh, had a concept. He called it uh, Kalavankara which means cheating time. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and basically, yoga was a way of cheating time. I think he meant keeping your body from aging, a, a mm. cheating time in that sense. But whatever it was, he definitely, the, the, the concept yeah. was there. There are wonderful stories in the Bhagavad Gita about uh, uh, what happens when a character who wants to uh, experience more in life uh, meets Krishna, and he says, Krishna, show me something about the nature of time so I can experience more in life. Krishna says, uh, okay, oh, but first would you, uh, would you uh, bring me a cup of water from mm -hmm. inside that house over there? Yeah. And so he goes to get a cup of water inside the house and he sees a beautiful woman in there and he talks to her and he really love, finds out he, he's really in love with her. Uh, he spends days and nights there. He marries her. He has a whole bunch of children. Uh, everything comes on. Suddenly there's a huge storm and it, rain comes and the whole house and everybody in it is wiped out except him. And he, when he wakes, when he comes up, uh, gets awakened from, from being knocked out, there is standing Krishna, and Krishna says, where's my cup of water? <laughs> <laughs> there are similar stories, I know, in the Sufi tales yes. as, as well, and they do seem to be pointing towards the idea that uh, maybe an entire human lifetime can pass in an instant. Exactly, exactly. The, the, the notion of relative time is a very key insight here into, in, into the thinking process, into the my, nature of mind itself. Mm -hmm. uh, it's, it, it's, really a, it's really a big hint. And so uh, studying further into the Indian philosophers, including some of the modern ones like uh, um, Rama Maharshi, mm -hmm. who was also uh, had amazing abilities to foresee things outside of space and time. There are stories about when a couple came to visit with him and uh, uh, before they could even say a word, he said, well, you, this problem is solved back at your home in Brazil. Uh, go back to the 
bench that you were sitting on in the park there and discuss what you dis were discussing there, and there is the answer to your problem. Hmm. Well, these people never told him he was from Brazil, never even mentioned what city they were from or what park bench they mm -hmm. were sitting at, and he saw all this, mm -hmm. and he and, and he had this kind of a, amazing ability, uh, and he learned. And this is the secret to yoga of time travel. He learned how to do it. The way he did it was he completely let go of even living as a living being. Mm -hmm. He just said, I am nothing. I mm -hmm. become the great nothingness. And he allowed himself to experience that. Let his nails grow, his hair grow. He, he, he became as, a, a total mystic. As I've heard the story, Ramana Maharshi would go into a meditative state so deeply that rats would come and nibble on his testicles while he's meditating, and it didn't seem to bother him. It didn't bother him. Uh, he, he had this remarkable ability, and mm -hmm. uh, he was an inadvertent time travel, mind time travel, as I'm saying, the yes. physical part of him, which is just a spreckle of dots in the time-space cube. <laughs> His mind is going into other spreckles of dots, mm -hmm. into not only in his own body, but into all the other bodies, which is the story of uh, Krishna. Mm -hmm. So uh, that he is beyond time, he's yeah. the lord of time. Mm -hmm. And Didn't uh, he say at one point in the Bhagavad Gita, I am time? I am time, exactly, uh -huh. exactly. And these, are, these stories uh, were where my mind went to get to the modern version of these stories, which mm -hmm. is what modern physics is telling us about time travel. Mm -hmm. And so I began doing serious research into what we know about going beyond the normal notions of time mm -hmm. within the fields of physics. Yes. And quantum physics is loaded with stuff. Mm -hmm. And uh, a lot of it, when it first came out, uh, when we first were investigating that back in the 70s, people thought that's crazy, having yeah. ideas like this. Yeah. But now it's pretty much mm -hmm. standard quo. Uh, so um, there are many, many exciting ideas that uh, that that, uh, that arise here. We can get into any one of them, so I'll let you... Well, let, let me ask you about your own experiences. Okay. Well, uh, I've had a couple of very profound experiences. Uh, this one I'm going to talk about now, it way it sounds by, maybe even a little scary. Um, during the 70s, uh, I had spent some time in various foreign climes, one yes. place or another place. And uh, when I was at the, towards the end of it, I was, I was living in England at the time. I was a visiting professor at the University of London, uh, Birkbeck College. Mm -hmm. And at that time, I, uh, one time I'd, I was uh, speaking with John Hasted and David Bohm, mm -hmm. who were the professors at that college, yeah. who had invited me to come there. Mm -hmm. And uh, they were talking about parallel universes. Mm -hmm. And I'd gotten very excited about some of the things they were bringing up. So I came home and uh, I began thinking about something. I was writing equations at my desk and so forth, and I feverishly, and I got very tired. So I went to bed. Next thing I know is I woke up and I'm in this real weird room. It's a cylindrical room. Mm -hmm. Why say I woke up? I mean, I woke up. I was in that room. It wasn't. It, it wasn't like I was having a dream of being in that room. I was present in the room. I lay on my hands, my legs. Uh, I, I was on the dirt floor. I uh, you felt the, fully conscious. I, I felt fully conscious. Not only that, I could touch the wall and feel it. Mm -hmm. I mean, all of my basic sensate modes were operating, mm -hmm. and uh, I was. What, what the heck am I doing here? And uh, and uh, then I thought, wow, this is really an interesting feeling. Mm -hmm. And as soon as I felt exuberant, I noticed I was f drifting up off the floor, yes. floating. Uh -huh. And then I got scared and I started to come down. Mm -hmm. I thought, wow, I can control whether I go mm -hmm. up or down by feeling elated or feeling frightened. Frightened uh -huh. condenses me, feeling elated opens me. Mm -hmm. And at that moment, somebody entered the room. And I said, oh, <laughs> I was shocked. Yeah. I said, oh, I'm sorry, I, I, I'm new here. He said, I know that. Come with me. Mm -hmm. 
uh, this is like you know a shaman a guru what is it this is before i i wrote uh, the book about the shamans mm -hmm. uh so I, what, what is it what is his experience so i followed him and we walked out into from an enclosed room where there was sunlight coming in we walked out into this beautifully vistaed green lawn rolling lawns beautiful blue sky and clouds and it was one of those beautifully spiritual days that once in a while you have the experience of it's a it's a wonderful feeling i mean music mm -hmm. is made about this uh, paintings are, uh, are 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 made about uh, this kind of feeling that one has mm -hmm. in this kind of uh, wonderful territory expansion of green and blue and white and mm -hmm. whatever a heavenly and sort of I, space more or less but earthly at the same time very mm -hmm. much so and he brings me to a circle of people that are sitting around on uh, stone a stone hedge, that big circle, mm -hmm. and all these people are sitting there looking into the center. And he brings me in, and I sit down in one of this one of the spaces. And suddenly, um, I look up, and there's a woman on the opposite side of me, just opposite. And she gets up and she says, "Hello, hello, mm -hmm. uh, who are you?" And I said, well, I, uh, I guess I'm here. <laughs> I didn't know how to answer that question. Mm -hmm. And uh, she said, oh, you're very interesting. Uh, you're new here. Mm -hmm. And uh, I said, well, I guess I am. And then she started to approach me. And as she mm -hmm. did, I started looking at her eyes. And just like uh, the Beatles' whirly eyes, uh -huh. her eyes started to twirl. And I became frightened. And I said, mm -hmm. oh, wait a minute. I said, uh, I may be new here, but I I know I'm going to get out of here. I'm going to get. I started to uh -huh. to to do the the mechanism which gets you out of one parallel world into another. You yell bloody murder, <laughs> <laughs> and I started screaming. And next yeah. thing you know, I pop up in the bed, sleeping next to my girlfriend at that time, Nancy, and I'm fully awake. Yeah. I'm not. Oh, I just had a dream. It's I'm awake. I'm totally awake. Mm -hmm. And I I woke Nancy and I started explaining her what I just experienced. And uh, she thought that was an incredible experience. Mm -hmm. And uh, we then went to visit with the Druids yeah. because she was involved with the Druids at that time and the Druid master. And uh, she encouraged me to look, uh, tell the master what you had, your dream. Mm -hmm. And uh, I described it to him. And he first he asked me, what am I? And I said, I'm a physicist. And I described my mm -hmm. dream to him. And he spoke with a Scottish accent. And his name was Mom. And he's, uh, the master mom said, uh, you were a bit too careful, were you, laddie? I said, what do you, what do you mean? He said, well, what, you didn't take down her name or her address. Why don't you find out where she lives? <laughs> I said, it never occurred to me. Uh, and we, the more I began to think about it, I, I had the feeling that this wasn't an earthy realm. Yes. I was in some sort of, you know, they speak about the middle world between mm -hmm. the, the time you leave this planet to go to the, wherever you go next. Mm -hmm. There's a middle realm in yes. which adjustments have to be made because mm -hmm. you're, after all, going through a pretty big adjustment, uh, yes. whether it's rebirth or whatever you're going to go through. And I was in the this afterworld, this uh, mm -hmm. life after death world. Well, some people might call it the astral plane. The astral plane, that's right. Mm -hmm. And so for me, this became very real. Mm -hmm. uh, and it was, what, my future? Was I seeing into my own future that this is where I'm going to be going when I leave this mortal coil? coil? What was it? I don't know. Another time, when I was doing research on my book, um, uh, the uh, Eagle's Quest. Your book on shamanism. On shamanism, and where I yeah. traveled into South America and uh, other parts of the world, including, believe it or not, shamans in England. I found mm -hmm. them too, as well as in Native American shamans. Yes. Uh, yeah, we did an interview on that one. We did an interview on that yes, one. Indeed. And uh, the uh, one of the things that happened during that that uh, period was that. Um, I had a dream, this was well before I even knew I was going to Peru, that I was involved in a ceremony in Peru and I was to be sacrificed mm -hmm. by the Peruvians. And I remember uh, maidens were touching my body and anointing me and whatever. And then the shaman came up and put a knife right into my heart and that awakened me. And I mm -hmm. thought, whoa, what kind of dream is that? Uh, I, the next thing, six months later, 
my shaman who I'd met in New Mexico mm -hmm. uh, shortly after that period or during that period, I'm not sure when, invited me to come to Peru to meet his shamans. Mm. And while I was there, I came in June just at the time that they have a special ceremony which takes place uh, in uh, the upper part of uh, uh, Cusco, in Cusco. Yes. Uh, so I was on my own. I, did, I wasn't invited to go to Cusco. I just said I want to see Cusco. Mm -hmm. So I went there. Yeah. And uh, while quite I was a there, city, the oldest city in the Americas. That's right. Mm -hmm. So I went there, and during the time I was there, a special ceremony was going on. Mm -hmm. And in the ceremony were the same shamanic priests that were in my dream. <laughs> okay. And instead of sacrificing me, they were sacrificing a llama. Oh. So, uh -huh. this is pretty profound. Yeah. This was so what you're suggesting is that these experiences are more than mere fantasy. No, they're not fantasies. Because while you're, you see, see, fantasies are things you just whimsically think about, mm -hmm. or whimsically have, or uh, they're, th th when you're having a, a, a real experience in a kind of dream mode, it's not a fantasy. It's more you're there experiencing it in the same way that you're experiencing this life at this waking period mm -hmm. of your experience. It's the same. It's, you, you only know it's a dream because you can remember how you got there. Mm -hmm. And how you got there was when you went to sleep. Mm -hmm. And that's the only thing that tells you that you're not really dreaming. I've had several of those experiences. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. <laughs> One time I, 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 I woke up in a house and uh, uh, I looked in the mirror and it wasn't my face. <laughs> I said, oh, this can't be me. Who is this guy I'm looking at? Yeah. Uh, so there are several, th these are stories or indications to me that mind is not contained right. in well, the mind. Well, the quality that seems to unite these experiences uh, for you is that they were all very real. You were lucid. I was very lucid. Mm -hmm. uh, more, maybe more lucid then than I may even be in waking life. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I understand that, but also, also I know in psychology there is a phenomenon known as lucid dreaming, where yes. people experience them, themselves as, as being awake, but they are also in a dream. That's right. That's right. So and you're, this is, you're the, describing something even different from that. It, it's like that. Uh -huh. It's like that. Um, the, 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 in, in some ways, the only thing that tells you that you're not dreaming or that you are dreaming is that you can remember how you got to where you got to. Mm -hmm. uh, your past is only goes so far as to when you went to sleep. Mm -hmm. So you can remember that occasion. You don't remember being in that world before you went to sleep. Yeah. But you're not remembering that you're sleeping when you're having the experience. Well, it sounds like also you're talking about not so much time travel, but travel to a realm outside of time. Maybe, but remember with the Inti Rami experience, the one in, in Peru was, yeah. I had dreamt about that, that came in yes, the future. right in the future. Yeah. Well, y you know, uh, Shafia Karagula, the yeah. psychiatrist, has written a book that came out back in the 60s called Higher Sense Perception, and she described a patient of hers, a woman she called Diana, who had dreams night after night after night of being in a classroom and receiving a, a variety of mystical teachings with a group of other people. And on one occasion, she did what the uh, Scottish Druid recommended that you do. She she actually f uh, was able to identify an individual who was uh, in her dream repeatedly, night after night, and later on managed to contact that individual who lived across the country, someone she never had met before, but it was a name, and uh, she was able to locate that person, and he reported that he was having the same dreams. Wow. So there pretty does appear to be some sort of a, uh, I guess you could call it a consensus reality about some of these experiences. You know, the, the, the normal way people talk about that is connection, mm -hmm. but that's not the right word. Mm -hmm. uh, it's all one to begin with. 
it's not connecting anything because they're experiencing the oneness out of which they're having a separate separate We described earlier the nature of the photon itself. That's right. It's so it's photonic, it's like, yeah, it's mm -hmm. mind photonic in that sense. It's not, exp it's not bound by space and time. It's as if uh, there's only one photon in the whole universe and it's everywhere and at all time. <laughs> one time John Wheeler gave a call to his, his student, Richard Feynman, mm -hmm. at the time when Richard Feynman was in graduate school at Princeton, and uh, said to him, I know why electron, wh uh, I, uh, I know why electrons uh, can go forward and backward in time. And Feynman says, well, what do, you, what do you mean? And he says, well, there's only one electron. <laughs> <laughs> and it's zipping around forward and backward in time. And that was, that was mm -hmm. one of uh, his intuitions, uh, mm -hmm. uh, John Wheeler's intuitions. And, and th it's surprising that, mm -hmm. uh, I mean, he was such a mystic. Well, surely there's an enormous lore from almost every culture of experiences of the type you've reported. Uh, there's remote viewing experiences, experiments showing the uh, ability of the human mind. The parapsychological literature is 150 years old now, and right. there, there are hundreds and hundreds of fascinating cases. But in physics, we're getting to the point where Physicists are seriously looking at the possibility that we might, at some point, uh, travel through time uh, in in a physical way. Yes, the, this is this is a very serious enterprise right now, and uh, uh, the question is, what ways can we do this? And uh, People noticed back at the time a physicist Kip Thorne and mm. some of his associates at Caltech had come up with the idea that a black hole, wormhole type of black hole, which is really a black hole in which you enter one universe and come out in another one, or enter in one place and come out in another place that's far distant mm -hmm. because of the bending of, 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 of space-time, yes. uh, that it's possible that you could take the two ends of a wormhole and you can sh ship one off into the future and leave one in the past, such that if you were to shoot through the wormhole and go in no time up to the from from the f past into the future, you would not have aged. And if you go from the future back to the past, you would not have aged. But people on who are not in mm -hmm. the wormhole would normally age. Right. So you have the possibility of a wormhole time machine, mm -hmm. uh, in which all kinds of interesting stories uh, can be told. And one of them is in my book, The Yoga of Time Travel. Yes. Uh, so the idea of wormholes, the problem with wormholes is that nobody knows how to keep them open long enough to have this happen. Mm -hmm. uh, because a wormhole is kind of like, um, it, it's like, an, a, I mean, it's, 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 it's in space and time and gravity. Gravity gets into this, mm -hmm. which is another question about what it does. But gravity wants to choke the wormhole off. So you need something which is anti-gravitational mm -hmm. that'll keep the wormhole from choking off. Mm -hmm. And it's believed that possibly dark energy could be oh, yes. a mm -hmm. means because dark energy is causing uh, the universe to uh, accelerate in its expansion. It's acting in repulsive gravitational mode. Mm -hmm. So it's possible that that is a hint that there are wormholes of time travel all over the place, and we just haven't been able to really find a way to look for them properly. Mm -hmm. So who knows? I mean, it, it may be that dark energy is a hint to that. Well, you know, we've only had uh, theoretical physical models of wormholes for less than 100 years. Oh, so yeah, only about 50, yeah. Uh, one can well imagine that, let's just say, a 1,000 years from now, if human civilization survives, uh, physicists will be yeah, uh, discussing the sorts of things that we're talking about, right. but they'll feel like old hat. Right. Um, recently, uh, well, recently, within the last 20 years, a physicist, David Deutsch, who is at uh, Cambridge University in, in, in England, um, began to think about the logic of time travel. Mm -hmm. And he's a, he's a, 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 a genius at uh, using quantum physics to talk about computation. Mm -hmm. And the idea of 
quantum bits of computation called Q bits. Yes, in, in a quantum computer. In a quantum computer. Yes. And he was wondering what would happen if you were to take a Q bit and send it through a time loop back and then come back to where it was uh -huh. and interact with itself. Uh -huh. What would it do? Having traveled back and forth in time. Yeah, and it would, yes. yeah that's okay. right. It, it, uh, it enters a time loop and comes back and mm -hmm. then it, it exits. So uh, in a certain sense, uh, it's in two places at the s quote mm -hmm. same time, uh, but it's kind of a bizarre thing to think about. Um, what would it do? And uh, in the book, my book, You'll Give Time Travel, I began to look at well, what happened if you had two travelers. Uh, and one traveler is has a time machine, some kind mm -hmm. of wormhole device, and he's moving along, and uh, the future's coming up, and he thinks, well, I'm going to make a statement to myself. I'm going to make this proviso. If I do not pop, if if I haven't popped out of the time machine, in the which is in the past, if I haven't appeared in the past before, then I'm going to go into the time machine and travel back in time. On the other hand, if I do pop out and there's me there mm -hmm. and I got two of me then, then neither of us will go into the into the time machine. <laughs> <laughs> and two of us will be in the present. <laughs> will be in the present forever. Me and, uh -huh. and yeah. So uh, <laughs> the the guy yeah. so if the guy so let's say I'm it's going along. It's a perfect along, way to clone yourself. Y yes, exactly. Uh -huh. So let's say I'm going along and and I'm moving and I'm aging as I'm going mm -hmm. along and suddenly uh uh, a, a version of me comes out in in the past, and yes. there we are, two of us, yeah. aging and going on. Mm -hmm. Or let's say that in in one universe, I or let's say I decide to go into the time machine, and I travel back, and I come back out of the wormhole, and there's a paradox here. I mean, how do you can yeah. how you gonna do? It? So, Deutsch came up with the idea. Well, there's parallel universes you can go mm -hmm. into. So think of the one time traveler uh, who. Goes into a parallel universe, comes into the second, goes into the second parallel universe mm -hmm. in which he already exists, and the two of them go off together, and they don't time travel. The theory travel. of parallel universes suggests that there are maybe infinite number of us existing every time we confront a decision. The universe splits apart, and we actually yes uh, actualize every possible choice. Yes, that's that's one mm -hmm. of the three. This Fred, is kind of an we're out of time. <laughs> Okay. <laughs> we're up against time as a limitation, but thank you so much for spending another delightful half hour with me. Thank you, Jeffrey. And thank you for being with us. Be sure to check your listings for part three of our three-part series on time, space, and consciousness. Thank you.